Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. We have Millennial Mike on the show and I first heard about Millennial Mike on Michael Zuber's One Run A Lot of Time podcast. And um, Millennial Mike has got an interesting background. He is uh, uh, by day a uh, police officer and on the SWAT team. So he's been has all the advanced training. Do you, do you handle the canines too or no? I am not a canine handler specifically, no, but they work with the team. All right, I have a Belgian Malinois, and uh, they're like they're like the the good police dogs. Oh yeah, yeah. So, anyways, mine's not a police dog, but she's a pretty cool dog. Um, <laughs> and so, Millennial Mike. So obviously, you're m- millennial, which may put you in your 30s somewhere. I don't know exactly, but I don't know what I am. I'm 44, turning 45. I'm like on the cusp. Yeah, I think you're, a, you're an elder millennial or, or the younger of Gen X. Yeah. I always get confused with what I am. <laughs> anyway, so so Mike, I'm not going to keep on calling you Millennial Mike. I'm going to just call oh, you please. Mike. So Mike, you live in Washington. You're a police officer, SWAT. At what point did you say, hey, there's got to be a better way to like re- retire look quicker, build wealth? When What did that look like for you? Yeah, so actually I was a lot younger and before I even became a police officer that I had made the decision, the conscious decision that I wanted to invest in real estate. I uh, listened to Grant Cardone before he was the -the over-the-top salesy thousand unit building portfolio guy. This was back when he was a little more relatable. Um, And the reason I had switched, I worked in construction for age 18 to 25. I switched to law enforcement at 25 because I actually, believe it or not, could get a better paying job in law enforcement. It's not like that in most places in the country, but California where you're at and Washington, they're actually pretty high paid. Um, I switched over because I could make more money and because uh, a friend of mine had been sadly killed and I uh, didn't take very kindly to that. So I wanted to do something about those types of things. So I became a, a police officer and now SWAT officer. Cool, cool. A lot of a lot of cops get kind of like, I don't know, you you see like cops get kind of jaded, you know, because you guys got to deal with so much stuff. Right. I mean, I couldn't imagine. I actually wanted to be in law enforcement. So I, I was like, when I was uh, in high school, I was like, okay, what am I going to do? I either want to be in real estate or I want to be a cop. And then mm-hmm. I was about to go into the Air Force to be an MP. That was my goal. I was okay. going to be an MP, military okay. police. And actually, even when I was in high school, I got a job. No, not in high school. After I, I was like 19, I got a job doing loss prevention because I was really into like, I wanted to be a private de- detective eventually. Okay. And I, I, w- I used to bust shoplifters. And that was nice. like a fun job. But the problem was I worked at this really rough mall in, in Hayward, California. And then I remember they give, you a, they give you handcuffs. They don't give you training. And they like <laughs> they expect you to like apprehend people. And I think that's so wrong because, like, yeah. quite honestly, if you make if you make an arrest, and first of all, you're wrong about it, you're going to get your butt sued and get oh, yeah. the company sued. But it was an interesting job because there was a lot of a lot of theft. We had in this in this um, in this mall, we had a substation for the Hayward PD. So, anyways, one time I'm, I'm using the CCTV, and we we catch a, a gentleman stealing shirts, and he ran out the mm-hmm. door. And then I, I started chasing him. I ran out of the office and chased him. And I had my, my, my walkie-talkie. I mm-hmm. had my handcuffs. Anyways, he, he sees me chasing him. He turns around, pulls a knife, and lunges at me. Luckily, he was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> he was like far away. He was never going to stab me. That's so, good. So, so basically, we ended up getting the Hayward PD. I somehow jumped in one of the Hayward PD's cars. Nice. All, we swarmed him. High-speed chase. Like 10 HPD uh, pulled him over, guns drawn, guy out of the car, and we ended up, or they ended up arresting him. Uh, but I was just thinking, God, to be 19 years old and like trying to do stuff like that is crazy without training. And so anybody that's doing loss prevention, I think they've changed now because I've been in Home Depot, um, you know, buying stuff for some rehabs in the past. And like now, People just routinely walk into Home Depot, oh, yeah. steal stuff, and people just watch them walk out yep. the door. Nobody yep. can apprehend them. It's so crazy right now. I, I think there's yeah. got to be a better way, but I don't know what it is. But anyways, I applaud you for being a police officer because it's a tough job. And you know, I think it's a shame to see what happens with so many, so many people getting disrespected in law enforcement. It's like 
hey, if we didn't have law enforcement, this this world would be crazy. And like, then those same people, the minute they need a police officer, you know, then they're crying, right? So it's it's, it's <laughs> then they call us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, anyways, we're not here to talk about law enforcement. We're here to talk about real estate. So you had you got early on in your life, you had the itch to be an entrepreneur to get into real estate, and mm -hmm. like your your strategy was like, let's get the best paying job that I would like to enjoy. And and your friend was killed, and that kind of brought something internally out. You're like, hey, I want to do good for society, and I want to I want to stop things like this from happening as, as mm -hmm. much as we can because it's never going to stop but right yeah and so got a, into law enforcement you get, make a decent salary and then you started with your first rental property and, mm -hmm. and what did that or did you do a house hack first or did you yes. buy an investment property yeah so i mean a house hack is an investment property i purchased a duplex in the seattle area at a time when the seattle real estate market was the number one appreciating market 23 months in a row uh, it was an extremely hot market. So I totally empathize with people when they say, oh my God, this, this market where it's crazy, dude, I get it. Uh, I bought that house hack. I live in it to this day, this duplex that I live in right now. Uh, best financial decision I ever made in my entire life was house hacking. It, it totally opened up uh, my ability to save and then reinvest more into more real estate. Yeah. So many people, like people call me and they want to get into investing and I'm do the financing, obviously. So I remember talking to this lady in San Jose, California, and I'm like, I'm like, how much are you paying for rent in San Jose? And she's like three grand a month. And she was talking about going and buying out of state for her first investment. Right. I said, right. you know what? Just do the low hanging fruit. Go get a mm -hmm. duplex, triplex or fourplex. Live in one. Right. Rent the other two out. Now you're not paying that three grand a month and you're probably netting an extra two grand a month in cash flow. Mm -hmm. So your net, your net difference is five grand a month. Take that five grand a month, stack it in the bank. Yes. And then go buy a property in Gary, Indiana. So Exactly. And so so let's talk about So obviously you did this house hack. Now you maybe probably pulled out equity, you know, cuz it's gone up a couple hundred grand. Oh yeah. Um and so w did you do another investment in in the Seattle market or did you start going out of state right away? So I went out of state. Uh, I sat around and I said to myself, I was like, wow, 20% down on a half a million dollar property here in the Seattle area. And now most of those properties are, you know, the median price is like $980,000 now. Um, I said, it's going to take me forever, even with a better paying job, even with the ability to save as much as I was saving, it's going to take me four or five years to save 20% down on these types of properties. Um, and I had a friend, fellow police officer from the East Coast who invested in the Midwest. And, you know, these houses, I'm sure as most people have seen, oh, yeah, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Birmingham, Alabama, Gary, Indiana. You can buy $50,000 houses, $100,000 houses with a payment that's cheaper than your Tesla. I mean, most people have read an article or seen a video talking about that. Uh, and so that was what initially interested me in the Midwest was cheaper prices. And then someone I consider a friend, fellow officer, and a mentor, Mark, he specifically kind of pointed me towards Gary. And uh, looking at the prices, they're fantastic. But then you Google Gary, and you're like, well, this is um, literally has been called America's most miserable city on the misery index, because we keep a misery index, apparently. Uh, three times the national crime rate, three times the national poverty rate. A third of all houses in Gary, Indiana are abandoned, burnt out. I mean, you look this city up and it just looks like the last place you would ever want to visit or invest money in. So I was extremely skeptical uh, when my buddy Mark, who just kept saying, hey, you know, have you thought about it? I was like, no way, man, I'm, I'm not interested in that. I, I'm used to Seattle with all the rich tech workers at Boeing and Amazon and you know Starbucks and things like that. Yeah, that's crazy. So just walk us through. So... Your your uh your colleague on the East Coast said, "Hey, I have been investing in Gary, you know." And then you, you started researching. And you're like, you know what? I looked at his deals and like they're great. They're cash right. flowing. They're combined fifty, sixty thousand dollar duplexes or whatever mm -hmm. you bought. So, so mm -hmm. walk us through. So so he hooked you up with his wholesalers, his agents, and that kind of thing. So you, right, you, you got it. You started getting deal flow, and you found what did you find? The first deal was it a single family, a duplex, triplex? My very first deal I got from a turnkey provider. I was I was not looking to undertake a project or a burr project from a distance, especially still a relatively new real estate investor. 
Um, and the number one thing you need in any real estate investing, whether that's far or, or, or close by local, is you need a good team of people to help you out. You know, I mean, I, Michael Zuber talks about how you're one of the guys on his team. And when you build those relationships, uh, it makes all of your deals and your business run smoother. So I wasn't looking to undertake a large project to get started. I bought from a turnkey provider uh, for your audience if they're not familiar with what that is. They're essentially fix and flippers. But instead of flipping the house over to a new homeowner, they put a tenant in it and they just sell it as an investment deal to an investor. So I got a brand new remodeled, new roof, new everything with a tenant already in it, paying market rates. Day one is when I bought it. You know, the tenant's already been in there for a couple months paying market rent. Um, and I got that for $60,000, an already performing asset. It just seemed a lot safer to me. And honestly, I would recommend that that's how people get started in another market if, if I was to give advice. So it was a single family renovated house. And what did that rent for? Uh, at the time, it was rented for like $895. So, you know, not that I'm an advocate of the 1% rule, but $60,000 house, $895, i am killing the 1%. Um, now, just... Three years later, uh, I'm doing a turn, a rollover on this one. The tenant, we had raised rents, but the tenant's moving out. We're putting someone new in at twelve fifty. So, and my mortgage payment's exactly the same three forty three. That's mortgage, insurance, taxes, everything, uh, and my it'll rent for twelve fifty. So, so you got a bank loan, not a DSCR loan on that? Yeah. Well, so you can get up to ten regular mortgages, right? So, I mean, that was only number two for me. Cool. And yeah, that's the beauty of being a W two. A lot of people. Are, I hear a lot of people, oh, uh, they always go, well, I want to quit my W-2. I'm like, you know what? The W-2 isn't that bad because the W-2 makes right. it easier for you to get conventional financing. Like me, I've been self-employed. It's hard to get, like I have all these business entities. I show losses. It's it's almost impossible to get bank loans. So, right. you know, like people just, I think the point of this show, if you don't, if there's takeaways, like start with the low hanging fruit start with the house hacks don't worry yes. about going out of state first you got to first get your house hack done where you live mm -hmm. where you're where mm -hmm. you're living for free and possibly cash flowing a couple grand a month you're right. taking that and you're now you got that extra cash that you can save you can save quicker than just you know because let's face it it's hard to save money from your salary right like mm -hmm. you go oh i make a lot of money but the time the tax man comes the time the you know you spend money on going to Chipotle, all this stuff adds up Starbucks. You have no money to save. Like you were saying, hey, to save yeah. hundred grand takes a while. Yes. So, so the key is then finding a, finding a lower cost market. Um, and I did a similar thing. I went to another part of Indiana and I was buying properties, right? And mm -hmm. I didn't buy a turnkey and I you know, had to cut my teeth, you know, building the boots on the ground, but mm -hmm. it's worked out. All in all, it's worked out and I own a bunch of doors there and I'm pretty happy. So you are you now just mostly staying in Gary because you've built up the team, you have property management in place? Is that how? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, Gary, Gary is a straight cash flow play. Uh, when, you know, a lot of people invest for appreciation. I don't think it's the smartest thing, uh, but some people do it really successful. A lot of people invest for cash flow. Some people have a blended strategy. Uh, personally, in my opinion, Gary, Indiana, you, you're going to see small appreciation over the last year and a half, two years for COVID, like the entire United States saw, of course, we had some pretty good appreciation. Um, but it's, as of the numbers I gave you earlier, it's a cash flow pay. It's renting for twelve fifty, and my complete total cost on the mortgage and, and everything included is three forty three. dollars You're making a bunch of money monthly and leftover actual profits, but it's not really going to appreciate. Uh, the reason that I stay in Gary is because I like that cash flow. When I buy a deal, I'm just thinking in my head, I want to buy cash flow. And I want to get to the point where enough is coming in that I can just completely run new deals and new projects, pretty much copying a strategy of uh, Matt, the lumberjack landlord. I don't know if you know him, but I just got back from a trip with him. And uh, you know, he schooled me up real good on how to grow from where I'm at to where I want to go. Um, but yeah, I, at some point I will move not out of like Indiana, but there's a few nicer cities that I might go ahead and try to move into to get some a little more expensive rentals that are maybe a little bit nicer area. So I just have a, a little more stable, diversified uh, portfolio. So obviously you have a, well, I shouldn't say obviously, you have a third party property manager there, I'm assuming? Yes. Yes. And I don't recommend people try to manage from a distance. It can be done. But I promise you, there's differences in the culture there. There's differences in the laws there. There's, 
There's so many challenges that come with managing a property that personally, I would never recommend somebody manage their properties at a distance, at least not to start. You need that person on your team, helping you, coaching you through the process um, and keeping you from making some dumb legal mistake or getting ripped off by a tenant. Yes, I use a property manager. Do you have any tools you use like to run deals? Like when, when a new deal crosses your desk, do you use like dealcheck.io or do you use bigger pocket calculator? What do you use? You know, I, I've seen all these calculators. I see the fancy videos online. I just am very old school. I write it down. I got a calculator. I'll have it like my own little spreadsheet, but I'm calculating cash on cash return, the amount that I get back yearly versus my original amount into the deal. Uh, and that's what I look at to compare just about every deal with every other deal. I'm, I'm relatively simple. I set aside money for vacancies, maintenance and expenses um, and paying the property manager. But yeah, I, I don't I don't have a specific app that I'm promoting, at least not as of yet. Yeah, no. So like I use dealcheck.io and uh, Rehab Valuator just because I know that the founder of Rehab Valuator. But uh, I like those two. Um, just cause I like simple things like, and then, mm. but, but I'm like you, I just pen and paper. Okay. What's right. this? Like I've always done that. So let's move on now. So, so now it seems like you're buying deals direct and not uh turnkey. Is that kind of accurate? Yeah. Honestly, I've kind of been all over. I mean, I bought turnkey. I bought straight off the MLS with a real estate agent. I've done a wholesale deal. I've done a couple seller financing deals. I, I mean, I've done a little bit of everything surprisingly, given that I only have eight total rental properties and 10 units. So what's so now with the downturn of the market, what's happening? This whole debacle that's going on with raising mm -hmm. rates. What's the strategies for you going forward right now? Are you actively? Do you have a defined buy box right now? Right. And yeah. what's the strategies? Yeah, hundred percent. My buy box is three bedroom, one bath, thousand to twelve hundred square foot houses. I really like brick. There's a lot of brick out there. I want them to rent for anywhere between a thousand to twelve fifty a month. I'm trying to put Section Eight tenants in because I totally see the government making sure that they backstop people not being able to keep up with inflation uh, and a potential recession. So I'm really pushing into section eight at this moment. Um, my buy box is I want those three bed, one bath or a two bed with like a finished attic, finished basement that puts a tenant in there that's not going to want to move for several years. Your average section eight tenant stays for seven to eight years. Turnover is where you lose the most money, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, and that's my strategy. I'll buy from anyone. I'm talking to wholesalers. I'll, I'll buy and remodel, do a cash out on the back end. I'll buy it totally turnkey if the price is right. Um, and so I just, I look at everything that touches the MLS in my market and I'm constantly networking with wholesalers. Uh, and I think that's what everybody should be doing because you never know where your next deal is going to come from. At the event that you and I did with Zuber, I told the story how this guy follows me on Instagram at Millennial Mike. Some random dude follows me for months, messaging me back and forth talking to me about Indiana. One day, I don't even know this guy's name. It's just REI underscore investors. No picture, no posts. He sends me this deal one day. He's like, hey, what do you think about this? I, I, I thought you might like this deal. And I was like, shoot, I'd love that deal. You're not trying to buy it? Oh no, I was just thinking of you when I was cruising through a Facebook page. Well, great, man. And I bought a deal from a random Instagram followers recommendation. Like it, they will come from everywhere. So talk to everybody. I love it. Now, what's that book near you? Is that a book you wrote? No, no, this is the millionaire next door. Actually, oh, okay. usually I have Michael Zuber's book here, uh, but I have been traveling and I brought his book with me for him to sign it. So I was like, oh, shoot, it's in my backpack downstairs. So I just threw this up so you don't see my video game collection. <laughs> and and you're, you're on a weekly show with Zuber's on the One Rental at a Time yeah. podcast? Yes, yes. Yeah, we and do a did, weekly series. How did you connect with Zuber? How did that all happen? We met years when I bought my first house hack property. This is one other thing I talk about. You need to virtually network. You and I actually met in person, but most of the people that I've met, Dion, Matt the Lumberjack, Michael Zuber, I've talked to them for years. Never met him in person until just recently. Mike and I connected in a Facebook comment section, a comment section of a Facebook page about real estate four years ago. He had less than 2,000 subscribers. He asked if I'd be willing to chat about my first rental. I said, sure. I asked him to come on my YouTube show. He said, sure. And we just became friends ever since um, to the point where, I mean, I got invited to come down and speak at his event alongside you, which was an honor. Um, and yeah, I mean, you would be surprised at what people can do in the comment section of a YouTube video, Facebook page, or Instagram. You can meet very influential people and get skilled up and educated on how to do all the things that you want. Strangers have all the keys to the castles that you want to be in. Well, you know what? I think like, what's the, what's your handle on YouTube, but where can people follow you on YouTube? First of all? Millennial Mike, just Millennial Mike. Instagram, okay. YouTube, everything. That's easy. 
what what are your what are your kind of goals? Uh, what are your kind of your goals? What are your goals? What are you looking to do? I, I hate saying what are your goals, but you know we're going into twenty twenty three. What's your mission this year? Like, for example, this year, at, or fast or rewind it beginning of twenty twenty two. I said, you know what? I got married. I didn't buy any doors for like two or three years, and I'm like, that was stupid, right? Because I we just went through huge appreciation gain. Right. So 2022, I said, you know what? I'm going to go buy doors. And I bought a few doors and it felt good. Nice. But I think if we have these, these objectives and these missions early on for like our expectations of what 2023 is going to look for, what would that be for you? Like, are you, are you looking to, you know, pick up four or five or is two yeah. or three? Or are you, what, what would make you happy? Yeah. I think this is why it's important as a real estate investor, a new guy, or even me, I'd consider me moderately skilled and successful at this point. Um, it's important to network with people who are doing better than you. Because yeah, I mean, I have the goal. I want to buy more doors. I want to create more cash flow. Obviously, I'm working my way towards retiring from law enforcement. You know, that's a young man's game. I'm not as young as I used to be. And it hurts to get punched in the face <laughs> or have somebody turn around with a knife and lunge at you like what happened to you. Um, and so my, my goal is I was chatting with Matt, the lumberjack landlord, who's great, 135 units, doing it for over 20 years, absolute stud. My goal now is to make relationships with local banks and lenders, even more local contractors, move into more larger unit properties like four and five and six plexes, and really try to grow um, not only my skill as an investor, but my portfolio, because it, when you do the math, I guess maybe I don't know how it works in California, but certainly in Indiana, those two, three, four, five, six unit buildings really cash flow well and uh, can put you in a great position to retire early, which is one of my goals. I want to spend more time with my son. I'm a single father. I have full custody. You know, I like to spend time with my kitty, six years old. Uh, so I want to kick this recession in the teeth. And the way that I'm going to do it is I'm not afraid of the market going up, down, or sideways. I know how to make a deal work. And what I want is to convince some bank to get me some good lending programs. And I've seen the strategies that the Lumberjack uses. And I'm going to work on my presentations and see if I can get someone to partner with me um, and uh, kick some teeth. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I've been in lending for 24 years. Um, these When you're buying in these different markets, the key is yeah you need guys like me but also to make connections to local credit unions and banks because sometimes they'll do programs that nobody can touch they'll right. give you like 80 percent plus rehab just almost like a fix and flip loan that rolls into perm i was talking mm -hmm. to i interviewed a guy that was doing this in texas and i was like you know what you have amazing terms until they they cut you off keep buying with that right. bank and that's the key and and yeah and i think that the local banks and gary and I, you know what I love about these cheap, these inexpensive properties? Like I bought, I have an investor carrot website and it's geared for South Bend, Indiana. Mm. And, and before I used to rank it, I, when I was paying attention, it was easy to rank because it wasn't as much competition like five years ago, six years ago. Mm -hmm. And I get, I got bought the two, two of my best deals from that darn website. So <laughs> if you got a little bit of time, investor carrot websites. Sure. Uh, Trevor Motch is, is he's the founder of the company. Actually, those websites kick butt so i would build one in gary and get sure. motivated sellers to go do it but i bought a i bought a, a two bedroom one bath bungalow for ninety six hundred dollars i put i put in i put in i put in a uh, six grand to make it rent ready and, and, it, and it rents for 700 bucks a month and it's worth about six it's worth about 60 grand right now you stud that's fan that's a great deal right there yeah i mean you just think every month you know, minus expenses and whatever happens, but seven hundred dollars a month, right? Like, yeah. The beauty of real estate is that, like, once you get the momentum going, that's seven hundred dollars mm -hmm. that hits my account. That that other, you know, the fourplex that hits my account, the duplex, the other single family homes, the fourplex I just bought in Pennsylvania, the duplex, right? All these properties over time, and it it does, you know, at the end of the day, the cash flow isn't like crazy great. I mean. It's not like life changing the time you pay mm -hmm. property management, mm -hmm. but like it co it compounds, right? Right. And then then you grow equity, and then you have the tax benefits, and like you can literally do it one rental at a time, and that's right. what's exciting about it. And and then you know, and then also, I'm curious on this for you is like, what's the next house hack strategy that you're going to do? 
It's a great question. So Dion from Dion Talk, another guy that he actually spoke alongside me at Zuber's event. He's been, you know, kind of just bumping at me and, and poking at me lately and saying, hey, man, look, I, I get that you're doing well in Gary, but you qualify for another low 5% down owner occupied house hack on a half million dollar property here in the Seattle area. And he's like, you need to take advantage of that. And he's right. Because if I move out of this one that I'm in right now, I mean, I, I, I almost completely cover the mortgage on one side. 2150 is what each side rents for. I mean, I'll make $2,000 in cash flow by moving out of this and moving into another house act, which I qualify for. So I will be doing, and this is a strategy that we talk about on those channels all the time, you know, hey, move from one house act to the next every few years and you will build equity in these, these extremely expensive properties if you live in an expensive area like I do, like you do. Uh, and so I need to do that. I'm actually uh, up for promotion to sergeant at my job as a police officer. Um, and with that promotion will come a move because I'll most likely have to move into whatever beat that I'm working. Um, and so I, at that point, I will, I will try to see if I can buy a property. And I'm hoping to do that here in the next couple of months. It happens to line up with a recession we're going to experience. Maybe I'll get a good deal. That's what I'm, I will get a good deal, but <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Have you ever run into Thatch? You know, Thatch? Yeah. I do. I do. I actually, I've seen him at like a meetup in Seattle, but it was a larger meetup. And so I didn't like get a chance to chat with him personally, but yeah, he's always out filming all over the Seattle area. We've messaged on Instagram a couple of times, but he's yeah, a cool guy. Cause Ty and Thatch are like this. Yeah. And so I've, I've met just online. We had Thatch in a podcast and stuff. He's awesome. I love Thatch. Yes. Uh, High energy a, dude. Yeah. And I love that he has this, <laughs> those fat rides and just, uh, he's he's entertaining and he's he's also very knowledgeable, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and he, he did it through selling real estate, created mm -hmm. a lot of wealth, and started buying a lot of properties. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's pretty amazing. So I like how you're you're thinking. Like, I'm actually going to do the same thing. Like, you got to go where the low hanging fruit is. So mm -hmm. I have owned my house here, and I actually don't live in California anymore. I moved three years ago. I live in uh, Las Vegas. Okay, uh, nice. Yeah. Besides, um, my lending business i'm also a, i work on the strip as an entertainer really i didn't know that i'm kidding i'm kidding oh, I oh I, I, okay i don't know if you're talking about like a speaker or something like that no, what type no. of entertainer we're talking about <laughs> i was joking but anyways i i love it here actually that's why i don't go to the strip but i living i love living in the desert it's beautiful but anyways so i i bought a house here three years ago right so i got some equity now and right, and yeah. uh so, but like this would be ideal to become a rental and mm -hmm. then move into like, now I was listening to Derek, the, that ADU guy. And it's like, well, yeah. why don't you go buy like something maybe with a detached garage, convert that to an right. ADU, right? furnish it, put some traveling nurses in there as midterm mm -hmm. stays. I like midterm rentals as opposed to short term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think that's a play. I'm also mm -hmm. interested in doing duplexes and fourplexes here in the, um, the Las Vegas area um, because I, I would do furnished housing uh mm -hmm. midterm stays because i'm here and there's such a demand there's so many people moving here and so many people come here for work that mm -hmm. i think i could crush it so i'm working on that strategy and i'm also considering in indiana some of my rental properties because i'm well networked online like we were talking about that mm -hmm. i just was on a call with a guy the other day and he wants to do group homes. So I'm thinking about master leasing my properties at like 2x the rent as, that I'm getting and putting them, let him do a master lease and just cash flowing more. So I think sure. there's a lot, there's a lot of, he's, he, he, he is in the uh, ALF business. He works for a assisted living company, but he's, he's well networked in. So we're thinking about doing group homes mm -hmm. and that could be an awesome opportunity. Right. What I love about Indiana is your dollar goes really far, right? Like you yeah. can buy hundred thousand dollar properties. You can buy fifty thousand dollar properties. Right. That cash flow, but even doing these other strategies, you can potentially even supercharge more. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Hello, Bo Eckstein here, host of the Investor Financing Podcast. Are you a lender, real estate professional, or vendor that provides products or services within the real estate investing and business owner space? We are offering a few sponsorship opportunities to get in front of a highly targeted audience. If you're interested, please click the link below for further information. We look forward to talking with you. Thanks. Make it a great day. So what are you doing 
what do you do on a day to day to keep yourself kind of focused, like uh, motivated? It seems like you, you know, you've you're pretty much in love with learning about this business and growing your business. Mm. Like, who do you listen to, mm. and like, what do you do on a daily basis to to kind of sharpen your knife? Sure. Yeah. So uh, there's a few different things, and I encourage people. You know, you got to make sure that you're staying focused. You got to make sure that you're paying attention to what's going on out there because you don't want to miss opportunities. Um, so I, I listen to a ton of real estate podcasts, uh, but obviously my favorites are the one rental at a time podcast, Dion talk and the lumberjack landlord. These guys have tons of experience. Um, I just got back from a three day trip where I was visiting with the lumberjack and he has built a 135 unit rental portfolio that cash flows an insane amount. I won't give his numbers out. I'll let him do that all by buying duplexes through sixplexes. I'm pretty sure his largest unit is a sixplex. I mean, we were driving around Dover, New Hampshire, and he's going, I own that one and that one and that one. And it just, I own this whole street. It was ridiculous. Uh, extremely experienced guy. So the number one thing that I do is I try to talk to people like him. I try to talk to people like you. The last thing I do in this interview is be like, what advice do you have for me, Bo, on air or off air? I want to hear it. Um, but if you are networking with the right people, I know it seems like a cliche when everyone says, oh, your network's your net worth, but I cannot stress how important it is to be around other highly motivated, skilled people doing better than you, because you will glean things from your conversations. You'll be inspired or like me, you'll just sit there and be like, God, these guys are killing it. I can do it too. I got to do it too. Otherwise, they're not going to invite me back. I have to show that I'm on track to stick with them. So reading books is great. You know, I, I do some audio books, but mostly I just listen to podcasts and I talk to people like you. TTP, talk to people. That's awesome. Yeah, the Lumberjack, I, I like, I listen to him on on Michael's podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I like his strategy though. D duplexes, the six unit properties. And, and like they're the easiest to finance too. Even though right. five and six units are considered commercial, they're really easy to finance. I mean, like mm -hmm. super easy to finance. There's, I like that. I mean, I like duplexes and fourplex. I love, right. I love multi units. I mean, it just makes mm -hmm. sense. It's like on my fourplex, even if two tenants aren't there, it's still still break even, break right. breaks even, right? Like right. So uh, the only thing I don't like about fourplexes. When they're one bedrooms, one bedroom seem to turn over a little bit quicker. Right, right, right. And you got to make sure that you're pricing in. Uh, if the utilities aren't submetered, that's mm -hmm. kind of a pain in the butt. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, there's a ton of duplexes and fourplexes. And honestly, my investment thesis thesis is that because of the lack of affordability, that these will always duplexes and fourplexes will always be the best for resale because yes. <clears throat> because there's people like you millennial mike that are preaching house hacking right, right so what are right. what what are these people going to do like when i go and like want to sell with this fourplex or this duplex who's going to buy it the next mm -hmm. millennial mike's going to go you know what it makes sense to own this duplex or fourplex mm -hmm. plus let's face it, it the cost to build these properties in like gary and, and south bend indiana you, you're, we're buying them like way under replacement value. So mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. kind of a no brainer because um, people need a place to live, even in, you know, whatever the most miserable place in the world, Gary, Correct. Indiana. <laughs> but, but, but I've heard, you know, I don't know what Tom Olson owns out there, but he's, mm -hmm. I've listened to him many times. Mm -hmm. he, he believes that that eventually will transition because it's, close to, it's close to Chicago, right? Yes. Like it's in the middle of everything. So, Anyway, that's pretty cool. I um, really appreciate this conversation. And I think it resonates with people because it's like, here's a guy that's just a normal guy, you know, shoots stuff. You know, he is, he's, a, he's good. He's good with a shotgun. Um, yeah. If you're on, how do you get, how do you get on the SWAT team? Do you have to like, a, <laughs> do you have to like, is it like a tryout? Like we have to like. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean it's it's a team. It, there is there is a very very difficult um, uh, examination process that you go through. Um, so you know the first thing you do is you you have to have enough time and tenure as a police officer to even be considered. Uh, from there, you have to put together a recommendation packet from supervisors and captains and other uh, people that you've worked with. You submit that, then you show up for tryouts. You have to <clears throat> do a physical fitness test. You have to do a firearms proficiency test. You have to do an open skills-based scenario assessment test. You have to do an oral board interview. 
Uh, and then after that, they rank you with every other hot shot who thinks they want to be on the team too. And it comes down to real close point margins. When a position opens up, if you're still on that list before they have their next set of tryouts, they'll give you a call or maybe there's a position for you. Then when you get on, you're in a probationary period. You better perform. You better do well. It's a huge, steep learning curve. Uh, but it's the most fun thing that I've ever done. I love it more than anything else. And uh, it will be the hardest thing to give up when I do retire because of real estate. Last question. What is the, the, the one skill that you've taken from law enforcement that's helped you in real estate? Dude, that's a great question. The best thing I ever did was become a police officer. And this is why I think when earlier I didn't get a chance to say, I think you would have been a great police officer because being a police officer is being a salesperson, making the hardest sale you've ever made. I have to convince someone to peacefully go into handcuffs and not run, fight, or do anything dumb. You have to have very hard conversations. When I was younger, I was a lot more of a people pleaser. Like, you know, I didn't want to like ruffle feathers. I didn't want to be rude. And I'm not saying that I'm rude as a police officer, but at certain times, yeah, you're under arrest. And I have to figure out how to deliver extremely bad news, extremely bad news, in, in the most positive way possible so that there's no use of force, so that they do what I need them to do, so that nobody gets hurt and that we can get them where they're in jail, wherever, drunk tank, wherever it is they're going. So the best skill that I have is being able to have extremely difficult, hard, but yet professional and respectful conversations with people. Almost everyone I've ever arrested has told me, thank you, or uh, you are a ni- you're a nice guy. Why can't everybody be nice and polite like you? And if I can do that, with someone who should, who sometimes wants to kill me, you know, I mean, I can have a hard conversation and negotiations with an investor or with a tenant or anything like that. So, I mean, I can't sit here and be like, everybody should be a cop first, but it certainly, it certainly um, has benefited me. And I think probably benefit a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I mean, that there is a difference between law enforcement. There's, you know, there's some law enforcement that I see that are like, like there's not a lot of law enforcement, at least what I don't see that are like you, which, like you just seem like a friendly person, right? Like, right. you know, versus like maybe like David Green when David Green was a BART police <laughs> officer. Like he just seemed like a giant jerk. Like I, would, you know, like I'd want to run yeah. just from him. And like, right. you know, versus somebody's like respective, uh, respectable, right. like respects me, right? Like even mm-hmm. though I did something bad, I'm right. a human being. So right. I think it's a happy medium because you have to be very firm and nice at the same time, right, uh, right? Right. Like, and if you can do that, which most people don't have the skill to, cause like mm-hmm. I put myself in like positions of like, like, like where somebody's could potentially have a gun on them or they're, they're armed or they're like got a knife on them. You're like, mm-hmm. you don't know, you don't know mm-hmm. as a police officer, you gotta Agreed. like, oh, you gotta be ready. And like, I'd be scared. I'm not lying. I would be freaked out. Like even the traffic stops where the, like, yeah. the windows are tinted. Oh yeah. And, like, cause like, Society is crazy now. So like you mm-hmm. got to be on your game. So that's what I, when I wanted to get in law enforcement, I saw like there was an excitement behind that, but also mm-hmm. I could see how, how stressful this, your job could be. And like, like these high stress situations, but anyways, right. this has been a fantastic interview guys. I, I hope you guys got a lot of nuggets out of this. I mean, like, listen, just the strategies here that we talked about are very simplistic. It's, mm-hmm. it's really not like, Oh, go out and raise a bunch of money. And like, you know, do all these crazy strategies. This is like easy, simple, do, do the work, know your buy box. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> I listen yeah, to that <laughs> super podcast too much. Yeah. But Bo, the buy box is important and how I was able to rattle off and define it. Everybody should be able to do that before they even buy their first property. Before you wrap this up, the way that I always steal golden nuggets, as you were just saying, is anytime I go anywhere, I want your advice. You're more experienced, you're more tenured, you're more senior to me, uh, a, a more skillful investor, and heck, a better YouTuber. What advice would you have for me that I can take away? Um, it seems like you're doing all the right things. I would say probably what I would do is um, I would probably, because you're now building a following of both people at work and online that know Mm -hmm. like and trust you is i would probably find one or two partners that could supercharge your growth so like Mm -hmm. when we're talking about buying six units and stuff i would get somebody like the lumberjack that might have some discretionary income that says hey i'll run point but would you help you know would you want to own portion of this building with me and then you can supercharge that way that could be an option Uh, Mm -hmm. i think collectively you know like a lot of people don't want to have partners but 
Right. Like if it gets to your, your goal faster, mm -hmm. um, what I, I was, I've been blind for many years and not looking at opportunities from a full spectrum. Like, if I felt like it was too big of a deal for me or whatever, like I would just not look at the deal, but really being a good real estate investor be means being a deal architect and figuring out how to get that deal done. So right. I think like your network and like supercharging and then like maybe you find a 15 unit building that makes sense to buy and you, you bring in Zuber and you bring in, you know, Lumberjack and Dion talks and, or whoever, right. right? Like I think you can amplify your growth that way. And still continue to do what you're doing because it would probably take you 10 more years to get where you want to get to retire. Man, right. Like in your mind, you're probably not going to retire. You're probably going to stay because <laughs> you, you like your job. But I think you could, I think you could supercharge and use OPM a little bit more because sure. even just for the down payments, like let's just say you found a, a, a property in Gary, it's like a $60,000 acquisition mm -hmm. and, or, and 30,000 rehab or whatever, right? You need 90 grand instead of like, yes, you can get uh, a loan for 70 or 80% of the total cost. But wouldn't it be cool if you just said, hey, um, you know, family member or whoever has money sitting in the bank getting 0% interest return, say, hey, right. 30 grand. Like, then you don't need money. Like, mm -hmm. you don't need to save up to buy the next one. You have the money. And so, like, having more financial friends and starting to focus on that just a little bit. And mm -hmm. I always, I always keep my financial friends as debt. I don't usually make them equity partners. I'm doing a deal right okay. now where I'm actually putting money into a deal where I'm going to be an equity partner and mm -hmm. I'm leveraging and that is a pretty good deal. But I would say that would be my, I would say open those doors up, have some financial friends. There's actually a group called the financial friend network. Okay. And you should also learn about self-directed IRAs. Sure. You know what? I, I, I have an IRA I've contributed to since I was 21 because I used to listen to Dave Ramsey. My mentor, Mark, who got me turned into real estate investing, converted his to an SDIRA, self-directed, bought a couple of rentals and it all tax-free. So yeah, I'm I'm turned on to that one. But yeah, I but like the networking idea. Your buddy Mark could be your bank, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. There's there's $26 trillion of dry powder or whatever that number is. <laughs> right. Right. Like, yeah. So um, go and follow... Um, quest trust company they have a lot of videos mm -hmm. on youtube mm -hmm. yeah learn watch how they're structuring their deals and mm -hmm. then you can you then eventually you can do that for people mm -hmm. they can lend your gap money for your fix and flips like that's i think your next step that you could wow. you could supercharge i think you're conservative you know you got to go within what you feel comfortable but i would say right. be, Working on those creative deal structures for you is your next step. And that would be my advice. And even I'm telling myself what I would tell myself if I, if I asked that same question, because that's, that's really the, the way to grow, because it's pretty hard to save up. I mean, no matter what, if you keep with your plan, you're going to be wealthy. And it just depends on if you want to, if you want to do that quicker, right. you know, quicker or whatever, but everybody has their own path. But I would say mm -hmm. that would be the idea. Like, I want to be one of these people's like people's one of these per people that can just structure deals, right? And just right. like figure out how to make this work. And that's what I love mm -hmm. about listening to Pace. Like she wants one hundred ten thousand dollars. I was the only one that would pay her one hundred thousand ten thousand dollars, but I I I don't pay her any interest. I just mm -hmm. pay principal loan, and mm -hmm. I, my payments three sixty a month, and the property rents for twelve hundred. I'm making thousand bucks a month in cash, like. I love hearing those to be a true deal architect. And right. that's what I see the big way to go is, be, you know, creating deal structures and then aggressively marketing to, to, right. to find these deals. But cool. I think you're doing all the right stuff and you're, you know, you're, you're growing. Right. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I would say the only thing I would look at is effectively partnering is it just seems to be the best way. Especially cause like, your other uh, police officer friend might have some extra money laying around and yeah. like you, you find a deal. Don't be afraid to like talk to people and just say, Hey, would you be interested in doing this? And I'll pay you back in a year. I'll pay you 12% on your money or whatever that number mm -hmm. is. 10%. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I was just talking to my aunt and she's like, Oh, I got, she was, she was going, 
to bank to bank for like to see who pays the highest interest rate for the day we've got. I'm like, oh, that's really going to make a big difference. She's probably sitting on like 700 grand in her bank. I'm like, oh my God. Whoa. Yeah, you let's know. put that to good use. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I want to use other people's money and, right. and, and, and protect their capital and make them a nice return. Mm. Friends helping friends win. That's the goal. Right. Right. Agreed. But anyways, this has been awesome. I'm going to send you a copy of this when it's edited. Everybody, I hope you enjoy this. Go ahead and follow Millennial Mike on Instagram, on YouTube. I know like this is like, I'm going to say this again. This is like the, the way to invest that makes the easiest sense. Like that first duplex house hack has literally changed his life because yes. that gave him the seed money, the confidence. He lives pretty much for free. Mm -hmm. Guys, this is where you start. Like, just watch this again and just, okay, get a plan to buy your first. If, you, if you're somebody that's been wanting to invest for 20 or 10 years, oh, I want to be a real estate mm -hmm. investor. Just go house act first. So mm -hmm. you, yes, where else can you get 97.5% financing on an FHA loan? If you're a veteran and you have a DD4 or whatever it's called, eligibility, you can get 100% financing with the VA. Take advantage of this, people. Yep. Take advantage of this. And especially yep. right now when the market softens. Mm-hmm. Define your buy box. Know when you know it is a good deal and strike. And anyways, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Millennial Mike, thank you so much. This has been awesome. And we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, Paul.